I can do a little bit of an introduction. So Lillian has been working for two years on this project and on many other projects as well. So she's working on a lot of different really important things within the Tims and Pearls International Studies Center. But our fun project, uh, our projects are all around um, these kinds of things that we do for now on the site in research projects, but at some time very soon, we will actually also use these kinds of technologies in um, real operational settings for scoring or validating scoring in international assessments. So this is really important work that grew out of a tiny research project that grew over time. So we just had an idea that we wanted to follow. Um, so Lillian has been working with Lana Koremdal and myself on also a, an IEA funded extra research project where we then try to expand the work a little bit. Um, and this work, uh, the whole series, and by the way, this is the continuation of the Brownback series for next semester. And the title of this Brownback is NLP and AI. And uh, this is more the AI part. This also has to do with uh, automated scoring, with deep learning. But we're going to learn today about graphical responses. So it's going way beyond usual text processing. Um, but we will see. So I let the floor, I hand everything over to Lydia now so she can tell you much better than I can do this about all this stuff because she has done a lot of very important groundwork there and dug through all the tools and then did a lot of experiments. So thank you and let's give her a hand. Okay, um, thank you so much, wow, Matthias. That was a really nice introduction. I'll try to follow that up in this presentation. Thank you to everyone for coming to the first brown bag lecture of the semester. Like Matthias said, this is going to continue. Um, and my talk today is going to be on our work using convolutional neural networks to automatically score graphical response items from TIMS 2019. So, like Matthias said, this is work that we've been doing for the past two years. It sounds a little complicated, so I'm going to try to walk you through it. I have some more intricate parts for the uh, stat R nerds out there, um, but I hope that everyone comes away from this understanding the basic concepts of what we're doing. So, I'm going to start by talking about TIMS 2019 and the items that we use. So, TIMS 2019 was the first TIMS cycle to be administered on a digital platform. So, about half the countries that participated took the assessment on a computer. And what's really nice about the digital environment, besides, you know, not having to print booklets and paper, is the ability to have brand new item types. So students were able to use drop down items, they were able to use drag and drop items, which are great. But the digital environment also allows us to take item types that we've already had historically and update them and make them easier for students to use. In particular, I'm going to be talking about the graphical response items that asked students to draw on a grid to express their geometry related skills. So I have an example here on the right side of what a student in Tim's 2019 might have seen for a geometry item that would ask them to draw, say, a rectangle on a grid. They're given a drawing tool, an erase button, and a reset button. One of the benefits of having this um, digital environment is that you have increased flexibility. Students don't have to worry about drawing their lines perfectly right. They don't have to worry about plotting everything correctly because there are some um, benefits from the technology. So again, this isn't a drawing test. We're trying to assess the student's skills. So they have things like straight line plotting. They have things like snap to grid. This is especially helpful for coordinates. Um, you know, a student doesn't have to worry about, am I getting it exactly on the integer axis, for example, they can just plot it. And then finally, we have what I think is maybe the best, these erase and reset tools. So students don't have to worry about, you know, did I make a mistake? How do I erase? Am I erasing enough with a pen and pencil? Um, instead, they can just hit one button to erase the entire response and then start anew if they need to, or erase particular lines. So in TIMS 2019, we decided to 
include more of these types of um, items that ask students to draw images as their responses. One aspect of this, however, is that they have to be scored by human raters. Um, these kind of responses at the time, we weren't necessarily tracking everything a student was doing. So human raters had to use their own judgment to decide, is this response correct or incorrect? And human raters have been the gold standard in international large scale assessments for these types of constructor response items, but they are subject to rater effects, in particular, fatigue, leniency, and severity. So if we think about fatigue, a rater is looking at hundreds, if not thousands of responses in a given day. And of course, along the way, they're going to get tired, they're going to make some mistakes, it's kind of inevitable. And then if we talk about leniency and severity, you might have a scoring guide that is as detailed as it can possibly be, but ultimately there's going to be some kind of human judgment that comes in, especially for more borderline responses where it's not obvious whether it's correct or incorrect. You might have a rater who, you know, might give the student the benefit of a doubt, say, eh, this could probably be right, versus another rater who is quite severe and says, actually, that extra line there means that we have to make it incorrect. And these kind of rater effects can impact the assessment as a whole in terms of accuracy. So again, mistakes um, when it comes to scoring can influence the accuracy and also the consistency of scores. And this is something that we see both within a country, so between raters, and also actually between countries. So some countries might end up being more lenient in their scoring than other countries. And this is something we're trying to not necessarily avoid, but trying to ameliorate. So we decided to ask ourselves, is there a way that we can use technology to validate these human rater scores in international large scale assessments? And the answer is yes. So first we wanted to see, okay, what are other international or just large scale assessments doing in general? Probably the most research right now is focusing on machine supported scoring of text-based responses and other large scale assessments. So we're talking about images, other uh, assessments are using text. And probably the example you all might be the most familiar with would be the ETS's E-Rater system that's in the uh, graduate record examinations. Just briefly, the GRE has a written essay portion. That essay portion is scored by a human rater as well as this machine, the ETS's E-Rater system. And then the score for the student is an average of the two. Now, if there's a large disagreement, say more than a point, then a third rater, a human rater, is brought in to then give that student credit. But this is a way for the GRE to be able to validate the scores on thousands of essays in a way that's cost efficient and time efficient. So we looked at this and we said, okay, so it's being done in other assessments, but what about images? Is anyone working with images? And the answer is, of course, yes. There has been successful classifications by machine learning outside of the assessment field. Uh, one of the big ones is the medical field, actually. Um, here, I cite a study for the machine-based scoring of cell images to identify cancer. Also, we're looking at uh, things like liver fibrosis with images. These kind of machine learning tactics that are being implemented have the same, if not better accuracy than doctors. And it's also relieving uh, that need for doctors to be able to have to look at every single image to try to predict something like whether a patient has cancer or not. Another interesting study that we found, I really wanted to include this one, is actually dealing with archeology. span So Palowitz and Downham, they actually had a number of ancient pottery fragments that they found, and they wanted to do a study they recruited a number of experts, so archaeology experts, to identify where in Arizona and at what time period these pottery fragments came from. Um, Flagstaff is a classification in archaeology. Tucson is another classification of a very certain time period and area. They also decided to use neural networks to uh, train on these pottery fragments to try to identify with feature detection. Um, which time period and which area these ancient pottery fragments are from. And so I have included a picture here that kind of gives like a visual representation. You see you have one pottery fragment here on the left, and then on the right we can see what maybe a neural network would see as in like hot spots. 
for when it's applying a filter of comparing it to a flagstaff pottery fragment or a two-scion pottery fragment. And it really comes down to these specific lines and shapes that are present in the image. And in this case, there's more of the red, so a high activation for flagstaff. Thus, the model predicted that this fragment in particular was flagstaff. And overall, Paulowitz and Downham found that the neural networks had um, accuracies that were on par with, if not better, than some of the expert archaeologists they recruited. So I mentioned a little bit about neural networks. I want to talk about neural networks before we continue throughout the presentation, just so you have some kind of foundation. So we decided when we are going to use our study or conduct our study that we are going to use neural networks because they're a very particular type of machine learning that is advanced and very successful right now. The neural networks are meant to have this kind of layered structure, almost like a human brain. So think of how you have your synapses fire, you take in information, you process it, and then you make a decision. That's kind of how neural networks work too. So you start with this input layer. In our case with image responses, this would be feeding in an image and also a classification. So that could be an example of putting in a picture of a cat and saying it's a cat or a dog and saying it's a dog. In our case, it's a picture of say a square and saying either this is correct according to the item or it's incorrect. Next, we have this hidden layer and that's kind of where everything really happens. So this is where all of the information is processed and where different features of the item or the response are detected. So in this feature detection phase, the neural networks are trying to associate different elements of an image with the classification. So say, if a uh, line is present that's this long and this wide, then maybe it's associated with being correct versus incorrect. So I've tried to include kind of visual representation of this. You might have, for example, I have here a square on a grid. You might have one part of the neural network that's trying to identify straight lines, another part that's identifying diagonal lines, and maybe even a part just identifying corners. And ultimately, over time, it's going to learn which of these different parts is associated with your classifications. Again, in our case, correct or incorrect. And finally, we have this output stage. And that's where the neural network is going to say, OK, I've taken what I've learned. I've gone through. I've tried to identify things. Now I'm going to take a response and say, OK, based on what I've learned, what do I think it is? Is it correct? Is it incorrect? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Something like that. And this process is repeated a number of times for the neural networks to, over time, get to understand and then eventually have what we would hope to be 100% classification accuracy. Now, there are two types of uh, neural networks that we're using for image classification. They're feed-forward and convolutional neural networks. Now, the big difference between these is linear versus nonlinear processing. As the name might suggest with a feed forward neural network, it's really just moving in one direction. So it goes across the images and it learns the associations in one way and then stops. A convolutional neural network has a lot more flexibility because it actually moves around the responses in a nonlinear fashion. So it's able to uh, make those associations uh, in a greater capacity. The one downside of a convolutional neural network might be that it takes a bit longer to run because it takes more processing time, but ultimately convolutional networks tend to outperform feed for old neural networks. And we found that in our own research and also other studies have found that as well. So despite their success, uh, artificial neural networks have yet to be used for scoring in any international large scale assessment that we were able to find. So we decided, okay, let's try it ourselves. So a few years ago, we decided to conduct a pilot study using a TIMS 2019 item from the Building, Problem Solving, and Inquiry task. Now, the Problem Solving and Inquiry tasks asked the students to go through a whole procedure. And so in this case, it was about 12 items that relate to a student building a shed, and they're all math items. One of these items in particular asked students to draw on a grid the back and side walls of a shed according to some given specifications. So we decided to, okay, take these responses where the student drew, train our neural networks, and then see what happens. 
So we trained our neural networks to score over 15,000 graphical responses. And the results were actually very promising. So we had very high agreement between about 91% for feed forward neural networks and 98% for convolutional neural networks when comparing our performance with human scores. So this is saying, okay, these responses that have never been seen by the neural networks that have been trained on other ones, on other responses, how do they compare to the human ratings? And in the case of convolutional neural networks, they're getting almost all of those classifications correct. So we came to two conclusions here. First, artificial neural networks, in particular, the convolutional neural networks, can indeed be used to score graphical responses. Great. We also came to another conclusion that we weren't really expecting. Artificial neural networks can actually be also used to identify incorrectly and inconsistently human scored responses. So in this study, we ended up reviewing the 9% or the 2% of responses where the machine scores did not agree with the human scores. And in a subset of those responses, we actually found that the human raters gave the wrong credit. And indeed, it was 2.8% of the entire sample um, were found to be incorrectly scored. So this was about maybe 400 responses total. So not a lot, but still enough to say, okay, maybe that we should pursue this validation technique a little bit further just to be sure that our scores are correct. So we decided to say, okay, let's look at more items, see if we can do this again. Uh, thankfully, we are awarded an IEA research and development grant last year to actually expand our work to eight other TIMS 2019 graphical response items. So we ended up choosing five items from grade four and three items from grade eight. So grade eight, a little bit more complicated. One of those items is actually trichotomous, meaning that it has three score categories. Instead of it just being correct or incorrect, it's going to be incorrect, partial credit, or full credit. So that's a little bit challenging. And then two of these grade eight items are actually released. So I'm gonna be showing you some pictures of actual student responses, and that's going to be from these released items. Now we had a certain criteria when we were selecting these items. First, very basic criteria was that the items had to assess students' geometry related skills. There weren't really any graphing uh, tool or graphical response items that weren't assessing geometry. Second, we wanted to ask students to complete different tasks in these items. So we wanted to make sure we weren't picking, say, three items that just ask a student to draw a line. That's not really helpful for us to be able to identify, okay, how do these neural networks work with different item types? Because there's more than just eight graphical response items in TIMS 2019. And finally, we also wanted to get an idea um, of how well the neural networks fare with items that have differing uh, numbers of possible responses. So I'm going to show you an example here, but it's really talking about whether uh, a student has about five different options to get it correct versus say 50, for example. So one of the examples here is a dichotomous item that asks students to draw the lines of symmetry on a given figure. So you can see in these images that this black <laughs> shape is what the students were given and they have to draw six lines of symmetry in blue. You see for the correct responses, the students don't really have a lot of flexibility here. They have to draw the six lines of symmetry. They can go outside the figure. They can draw them as dashed lines, but there's really not a ton of variability. If you look at incorrect, there's always going to be more variability in incorrect responses. For example, the student might try and only get two of the lines of symmetry that they need, or they might draw too many lines of symmetry or something that's off task or a nice geometric art piece right here. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated with some other items. So this is our example trichotomous item that asks students to draw an eight by three centimeter rectangle. Okay, pretty easy, right? But students can do quite a bit with this. First, they can either draw this rectangle vertically or horizontally. And second, they can draw it anywhere on the grid. So they could have it up here in the top left corner, they can draw in the center, they can draw in the bottom. So there's going to be more uh, of a challenge for the neural network to be able to associate where the rectangle is drawn in addition to how big the rectangle is with it being correct. Partial credit introduces a whole other challenge 
Um, not only is it another score category, in this case, I believe partial credit was given to responses where it's the correct perimeter, but incorrect area, or the correct area, but incorrect perimeter. There were actually six different shapes of rectangles or sizes of rectangles that a student could draw for partial credit. They could draw them horizontally again or vertically and anywhere on the grid. And finally, for incorrect responses, pretty much anything's fair game. They could draw anything off task. They could just draw the wrong size of rectangle. They could draw a completely different shape like a triangle. So ultimately, our neural networks are going to get a lot of different challenges throughout this maybe some items easier than others. So that was our very first stage in this study, was the item selection stage. Now I'm going to go through our three major stages that occurred. First, we're going to go through the response image pre-processing, then an initial modeling stage where we get an idea of how the neural networks are going to fare, as well as try to clean the data sample a little bit. And then finally, we'll get to our final modeling stage where we can produce our final classifications to compare to the human scores. So for the image response pre-processing, we wanted to make sure that our images are looking okay when they're fed into the neural networks. One element of neural networks is that when you take your image response, it might be you know enough for us to see, but they actually have to get shrunk down really, really small when they're put into these things called arrays for the neural networks to train on. The thing is, if you have the images be as big as we would want them to you know, be able to see them with, it would take a very long time and a lot of processing power for the neural networks. And they don't need all that information. They're fine with just having, say, 100 pixels by 100 pixels of an image. So what we do is we shrink them down so that the neural networks can take them. In this process, we are going to take our original image responses and we're going to make them grayscale. One of the reasons that we do this here is because we don't really care about the color. It doesn't matter for us. If you were doing classifications with, say, like a dog versus a cat, you might want to keep color and have that third dimension. But for us, it just adds another time consuming layer of processing we don't need. We also increase the contrast. So we do this just so the, the lines stand out a little bit more from that gray grid that's in the background. And finally, we actually apply pixelation to the image responses. Now, this might be something that is kind of counterintuitive. Um, to the naked eye, for us, it would look weird to pixelate an image because we're losing information, right? In fact, when an image is pixelated and then shrunk down into these arrays, it retains more information. So I have an example here of an original student response on the left, and then what that response looks like when it's shrunk down into that array for the neural network. So you can see here in this no pixelation, we actually lose quite a bit of information. We've lost a number of lines. And for this item in particular, I also found that if no pixelation was used, sometimes incorrect responses could look correct for a neural network. We don't want that. Instead, if we apply pixelation, you can see that all of the lines that were given and that the student drew are present in the final response. It might look a little bit gray, but that's fine. The neural networks can distinguish between the white and the gray here as long as all of those lines are present. So for the more R statsy people out there, I've also included a bit of example code for this. Um, we have a workflow that I can share via email if anyone's interested in knowing a bit more, but all of our research was done using R and R Studio and open source packages. So in particular for pre-processing, we use the magic package, which is used for image modification. Here I set the crop dimensions as well as the pixel width and height. So ultimately our images are gonna get shrunk down to just 75 by 75 pixels. I have an example function here of say, modify image responses, where we can see that we crop the image because we're working with screenshots. We don't want the entire screen that the student sees. We just want to see the grid. We're going to change the image to grayscale using this image channel function. We're going to increase the contrast using the image modulate and image contrast functions. And finally, we're going to pixelate the image by using the image scale functions, where we scale it down to its intended size, the 75 by 75. And then we scale it right back up. So to us, it looks pixelated, but when it gets shrunk down again, it'll look good. 
Now we also use the EB image package to actually place the responses in the modeling arrays. This is kind of a complicated function here. Um, I realized I'm going to share the slides with everyone as well. Let me actually put that in the chat. In case anyone's interested, I've uploaded my slides to Google Docs if you want to download them and look at this text in the code later. Um, but for this function, essentially we're just reading in a bunch of pictures or images. We modify those images. So I actually call this modify image responses function from the previous slide. And then what we're going to do is resize them and then put them into array. And finally, once we run this function, we're going to get a set of images in the array so we can feed those to the neural network, as well as what we call labels. And labels are going to be those classifications. So it's going to match the exact order of the array. So for response number one, if it's incorrect, it'll have a zero there in the label or it'll have a one in the label. And these are essentially just lists in R if you're familiar with that. Now we go on to the initial modeling stage. So we've set up our way to pre-process these image responses. Now we're going to do some cleaning up the data set. So first we begin with our sample assignment. In neural networks, you're going to want to have a training sample and a validation sample. So in our training sample, that's how the neural networks are going to learn all of those classifications. And the validation sample is going to be how they are the same, the, the responses to which they actually apply those classifications that they've never seen before. So it's a way to be able to get a unobjective classification to be able to judge the accuracy. Now, in our initial modeling, what we originally did is started off with assigning 70%, so the majority of our sample, to the training sample. However, after we did this for about an item or two, we actually realized that the convolutional neural networks were working very well. And we wanted to try saying, OK, well, what happens if you have only about a third of the data? So what we ended up doing was also training the models on this initial 70% training sample, but then also doing just like a little swap saying, okay, well, what happens if we train some different models on just 30% of the responses? How do they fare? And it turned out that for these items, they did pretty much exactly the same as if they got two thirds of the sample. So this was just a way for us to be able to train some models and then get some classifications to review. So once we construct the convolutional neural networks, we conduct the training either on 70% of the responses or on 30%. And then finally, um, we look at those classifications. So first, I'm going to include some example code of uh, how we actually run these models. So probably our biggest friend in this entire process was the Keras package. This is the user interf interface to TensorFlow, which is a, the machine learning uh, backend which provides all of the functions for us to actually be able to compose, train, and run these artificial neural networks in R. So I have an example here of just kind of a basic model that you might make, a basic neural network. We set up our model with this Keras model sequential function. We go and we use the layer con BD2. This essentially right here, this little middle chunk of code is just building the model itself. This is this first line here is adding the convolutional layers. Then we're adding some more layers to it. These are all the hidden layers in between. And finally, this layer dense at the bottom is going to be your output layer. So that's actually going to be giving you the classifications. We then go through and compile it with some things called optimizers and loss functions. And then we actually train the neural network. So once we built it, we train it on our training images using those labels or the classifications. And then the epochs is the number of iterations of training it's going to have. So this might seem really complicated, but it's all a matter of just kind of playing around, messing around with the structure. That was really what our pilot study and then a little bit of this study was doing is messing around saying, okay, how many convolutional layers can we add to make it better? Um, what optimizer works best? What loss function works best? In our case, it ended up being these choices. If you're using a different item or a different field, you might come to different conclusions. So it's really just about playing around. So when a neural network is actually being trained, this is what the user can see if they want. So you can see that in this very first iteration of training or epoch of training, 
the neural network doesn't really know what's going on. It's essentially taking in the information, it's trying to learn, and then it's essentially applying its classifications at random here. In the second iteration of training, it's taking what it learned from the first, from all the previous iterations, and it's doing a little bit better. And then we can see by the third iteration, it shoots up here to almost about 95% accuracy. So now when it's making those final classifications in the output layer, it's almost entirely correct. And you can see that it might dip a little bit, but over the course of about 15 epochs, sometimes in our modeling, we use 25 to 50 epochs, it gets to about 100% accuracy eventually. So that's our trained neural networks. We've gone through, we've trained them. Now we're going to apply them to our validation sample. So those responses that we set aside that the neural networks have never seen. And we're going to review any responses where there's a non-matching classification, meaning that the machine score disagrees with the human score. So I'm going back to what I originally talked about earlier with incorrectly and inconsistently human scored responses. So in this process, we found that some responses, the human rater score doesn't end up matching the machine score during independent review. And the human rater score actually is the incorrect credit. Now, this ended up being not necessarily common for some items. It occurred more for trichotomous items or items with more variation in the correct responses. So I've included a picture down here on the left of one of the example items, that dichotomous item, where it seems like the student got it right, but if you take a closer look, they didn't. So they have these six lines of symmetry and everything is good except this bottom right-hand corner. The line is just a bit off and the human rater ended up scoring this correct. Now they might've been giving the student the benefit of the doubt, but this really should have been incorrect. And it's kind of harder to tell with these two on the left, um, but these were both partial credit responses that ended up being scored as incorrect by human raters. This trichotomous item in particular was really difficult for some human raters because you essentially have to count how big the rectangle is, how is that different between partial credit and full credit? Mistakes did happen. That's okay, we identified those. We also identified some inconsistently human squirt responses. So these are responses that include some kind of extraneous information that makes it difficult for scorers to rate. And so the raters tend to actually score them differently depending on who's scoring it. And so usually these responses include extraneous lines, stray marks or incomplete lines. And ultimately it's very difficult um, for us to say for some of these, whether the students knew or didn't actually know the right answer. So I have a few examples here that you can look at. On the left-hand side, you can see a student who drew the correct lines of symmetry on the figure, but they also drew this extra little square. We'd probably end up giving that credit, but that's a real question because there are stray marks present. It's a bit more debatable for these three responses over here for the trichotomous item. Uh, a student didn't complete their rectangle here, drew some stray marks here, and then divided their rectangle into squares. And so the real question here is, okay, did the student know the right answer or are they expressing some kind of contradictory information that's saying actually they didn't know? So these are very borderline questionable responses, don't occur very often, but using the neural networks to identify them can be very helpful to set them aside and then get in touch with a math expert to say, okay, what do we think about these? So ultimately what we did is we took these incorrectly and inconsistently human scored responses out of our final data because we wanted a clean data set where we knew the human scores matched their responses. So for our final modeling, we decided to use training samples composed of about 20 to 30% of the responses, depending on the item. Some items didn't need that many. Some items needed a bit more responses. We also decided to use cross-validation. So instead of just making one sample with 20% of responses, we made five. And so we did this because we wanted to avoid um, having some kind of outlier occur we could randomly pick a sample where it ended up being uh, really great for the neural networks or, and then we overestimate how well we're doing or really poor and then we underestimate. Ultimately, there's not a ton of variation, but it's good to average our results. 
Then what we do is our, we train our models and we apply them to the remaining responses. Again, these are the ones in the validation sample that have not been seen by the neural networks, as well as that sample of incorrectly and inconsistently human scored responses. So we're going to get an accuracy on the clean data, as well as an accuracy on the more borderline and the incorrect cases. We did that because we just want to see, OK, when we come to our final model, how well is it able to distinguish incorrectly scored responses or inconsistently scored responses? More out of curiosity for us. So I've included a table here that shows the items that we modeled on, as well as the accuracy of the models and the average number of misclassified responses by those neural networks compared to the number of incorrectly human scored responses that we identified in the modeling process. So we found that the convolutional neural networks performed as well as and sometimes even better than the human raters. For dichotomous items, they had over 99% accuracy. Some of these items are getting up to almost 100% accuracy. And then for the trichotomous item, it's a bit more challenging. So it had about up to 98% accuracy, which is to be expected. That's fine. What we also found is that if you compare the average number of misclassified responses to the number of incorrectly human scored responses, sometimes the machine ended up misclassifying more, sometimes they actually misclassified less. So you can see for this first item here that the average number of misclassified, misclassified responses was about 11 compared to the 33 that we identified as incorrectly scored by the human raters. And this really did end up varying by item. You can see there's quite a disparity here for this final item. And that's because um, it was a little more unclear for the scorers um, when they were scoring. They were given a tolerance area. I can't talk about it too much because this is a secured item, but it was a little more unclear, leading to a bit more incorrectly scored responses. We also found that the convolutional neural network's ability to correctly classify incorrectly human scored responses did vary by item, but they overall did very well. So that's going to be this middle column right here in the second part of the table. So we can see that when the neural network has been trained and it's applied to our sample of the incorrectly human scored responses, it's able to correctly classify them. So according to a score by a third independent rater, about 95% of the time. And in some cases, for some items, it's like 99% of the time. It's getting almost all of those right. So this is essentially saying to us that the neural networks are very good at detecting these incorrectly scored responses. Now we've come to some conclusions based on our research. First, automated scoring with convolutional neural networks can be used to validate human rater classifications. As we've seen, they're having accuracies that are 98, 99%. And we can use these second set of scores to evaluate the human rater responses as well. Now, this is ultimately going to increase our accuracy and consistency of ratings across countries. So first for the accuracy, like I said, if you have two sets of scores, you can see where they differ. And if there's any disagreement, bring in that independent rater to come in and say, okay, this response that maybe was incorrect for a human, correct for the machine, I think it should get X score, correct or incorrect. And then in terms of consistency, uh, the machine essentially just applies the same scoring rules across all responses, regardless of country, regardless of score category, regard, there's no human rate or judgment there. Um, so that's really nice to have this kind of more objective uh, scoring device. Additionally, the Automated scoring with neural networks is cost effective and time efficient. So in terms of cost effective, you know, we're talking about instead of hiring a full time additional human rater to look at the thousands of responses that we have, we're instead using the R package, R studio, um, sorry, the CARES package, magic, things that are free and are open source. So really the only cost that comes into play is the person that, who might be hired to run all of these um, things, and then any kind of cost that might come with, you know, having a computer or machine that would actually be able to uh, run these models. Thankfully, here we have uh, access to the Linux cluster, and so we are able to run some of our neural networks um, training on that. And then in terms of being time efficient, 
really the time barrier comes in with training the neural networks. It might take an hour or two to train convolutional neural networks on 15,000 responses, for example. But the benefit is that once you do all that training, when you actually present the neural networks with all of the validation data, so again, 70% of your responses, the neural networks apply classifications in literally seconds. So it's a way to be able to, again, save the hours, if not days or weeks, that a second human rater would actually need to have to be able to score these items. I also want to point out that in terms of cost effective, again, what's really nice about having these open source software and packages is that the barrier to entry for anyone who's interested in getting into this is just learning how to do it and learning the scripts. And there's plenty of resources online that like are examples that walk you through it. I know that's how I started. So it's really a good way to be able to, uh, you know, have something that is accessible for pretty much everyone. And now there are some stages or some steps that we have for future research. We want to use automated scoring more in TIMS 2023. We actually used it a little bit in the TIMS 2023 field test. For the graphical response items in TIMS 2023, we're able to capture the student coordinates. And so what we do is we can score those with Python mathematically, but in the process of making these Python scripts, it was helpful to have the images, a random sample of images, not all of them, just to be able to check, double check. And so we compared neural network scores with mathematically computed scores to be able to see, okay, how do we get this uh, function working? And it's our plan in the main assessment to actually validate rater scores for drawing tool items in the main assessment. So these are more free drawing um, items where students actually don't have their coordinates scored because they're kind of drawing wherever they want. Um, what we can do for this is any items that didn't change from the field test, we could just train our neural networks on the field test responses and apply those trained neural networks to the data collection responses. Now, if the items were changed from field test to data collection, uh, then what we can do is just train on a subset of those data collection responses that we have. And finally, outside of TIMS, we hope that, you know, publishing this research and talking about this research will inspire other international large scale assessments to also pursue using neural networks for graphical response items. Okay, so that was a lot. I think it's it's been about 45 minutes. The floor is open for any questions that you might have. I'd love to answer them. If not, totally fine. You can take your time. I think somebody raised, you know, April, you raised your hand. Yeah, I did. Hi, Hi everyone. Good, good, good to, to see. see you. <laughs> Hi, good to see um, <clears throat> familiar faces and new faces. Too. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Linda. Oh, it was thanks. excellent. Um, I was wondering, um, when you talked about your training set, I think mm -hmm. you mentioned that uh, 20 to 30 percent of the responses were picked. Mm -hmm. I was wondering um, the approach to the um, representativeness oh, yes. uh, of the of the each uh, of each scoring category. Like, what, did you pay attention, for example, or did you set a criteria? Like, if it's a dichotomous item, about half of them will be incorrect. Uh, responses about the other half will be correct or if it's a um, three level item you know one third will be partial one third will be fully correct etc so I'm so happy you asked this because I think I realized about 10 minutes ago that I forgot to actually explain it when we do or construct our training samples what we end up doing is a random a random stratification so first we choose within country because we don't want to have you know too many responses from the US versus, you know, Japan, for example. So we stratify it within the country and actually within the score category. So instead of mm -hmm. saying we want 50% of responses to be correct, 50% incorrect, we end up just choosing 30% of responses, for example, within the incorrect, and then another 30% within correct. The reason that we do this is because we found for some of our items, especially the ones that are more challenging, you know, you might have students who are only getting about 20% of students are getting it right, 20% of responses are getting it right. Um, so you don't want to end up with a, you know, 
training sample that has an overrepresentation of correct responses, but maybe an underrepresentation of correct responses in the validation data. One other thing that I didn't really have time to talk about, but you can do is something called um, augmentation. So what we can do is actually try to augment our training sample to include some, how do I say this? Some image responses that we already have, but have been manipulated to try to get an increased percentage. So I know for like partial credit, if you only have 10% of students actually getting partial credit, what you could do is say, okay, so we'll take some of these partial credit responses and say, we'll mirror them or we'll rotate them and then put that in. So instead of just having, you know, a hundred partial credit, you could like make 200. I, I hope that answers your question. It's a little exactly. long explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Good to hear that. I mean, yeah. Sense. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Billy, I want to ask you, since you have done this for two years, you know, nowadays the open AI comes up and the chat GPT yes. or the formula and the algorithm behind it. Do you think someday the work you are doing that will be replaced by the codeless uh, programming too? <laughs> I mean, but you know, maybe. Some... soon, And how soon this will be from your perspective? I would, I would hope not. Now, some of the scripts that we've written actually can, as I showed you, can be quite simple. So I wouldn't be surprised if years down the line, a, a chat bot could write the scripts. But I think when it comes to um, looking at the actual results that we're getting from these and looking at those kind of responses where we have a discrepancy, it really does have to come down to the human, the human judgment to say, okay, what can we do? Because throughout this process, when we are looking at some incorrectly scored responses, some of those inconsistently, uh, I actually had to meet with Charlotte, our math, math expert to say, okay, what do you think about this? How about you tell me? Because it really does require some kind of expertise. Um, so maybe part of it will be replaced, but hopefully not all. So through learning from machine, through learning yeah. human readers uh, repetitively through mm -hmm. large sample and the correct rate for the chat robot will increase someday. That's what we think, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I we're seeing 99%, 98% now, but it might be even higher. Yeah, I think what Lydia mentioned is really important. So this is um, the task of making the machine do what you want will get easier, but you still need to know what you want the machine to do. Mm -hmm. to say it this yeah. So it's really important to have this kind of mix of content knowledge, methodological knowledge, and to have the ability to say, okay, what's what's the problem here? The problem here is human scoring versus machine scoring. The problem here is reliability, classification, accuracy. And in a context of where we have several sources of variation, and I think the machine can help you code or you can use no code tools, which all make it easier. But I think this is why we are also interested in this, because I think our Lynch School and the MESA department has particular expertise and things to offer in that regard, so that to understand how to frame the problem, how to design the solution that the machine cannot take away yet. They might, the machines might be able to help us code stuff and make it easier. The, the, the framing and the design, the, the model, the implementation of the model gets easier, but the, the model, the, the flowchart, the logic needs to be designed by humans, I guess. Mm. Are there more comments or questions? This is so. I hope you are all as excited as we are about this research. So it's something. Um, there, are, I, I do a little bit of self advertisement here. I think Tim's is a, a little bit of a unique international study there. So the content uh, assessment specialists, content designers, they think about how can we make it more authentic and closer to what's happening in the math classroom and students have to draw students have to do some construction and, and, and maybe even building stuff 
Um, and Tim tries to be close and somewhat, uh, um, yeah, uh, really aligned with the curriculum, aligned with what's happening there. Um, rather than having whatever, everything is just multiple choice or just uh, write your response or explain a response. It is a mix of different types of response formats that really makes the test for us very interesting. Um, it's certainly a mixed format test, so it's not all just the same types of items that somehow yeah, measure a, uh, a math skill uh, without multiple dimensions of what students have to do in order to show what they can do. And these graphical responses, I think, are very challenging because I think Lillian mentioned that free drawing is not that easy on the computer, so we have to be carefully transitioning these to these kinds of snip to grid or yeah. line tool things that, that are a little bit more easy to manipulate on the computer, but still stay faithful to the intent of the item. So there's also the, the art of them trans, transforming something from paper to computer. Yeah, hi, hi, Lillian. I, we have a met, great presentation. I'm Brian Smith. I'm over in the, also in the Lynn School. And, uh, hi, Brian. So, so hopefully I'll meet you one day. But you know, what you just said, Matthias, is something I was thinking about asking you, Lillian, because it seems like as I, as I saw the, and by the way, I remember Matthias, when we talked about this, like probably when we both came to BC and, and you mentioned, oh, we have these graphical items and maybe we could use neural networks. And I was like, wow, that's a great idea. So thanks for doing this. <laughs> right. It's exciting to see like, <laughs> like that was just kind of like, oh yeah, it was like a, a basement talk. And was like, yeah, like you could probably do that. And clearly you can, but yeah, but it's right. It really does strike me that, you know, the fact that like the ease of use on one hand, the usability that you have for the student is in some ways an advantage for the machine training right because mm -hmm. like it's grid right? mm -hmm. so some of the issues as i was thinking about like you know like just the high rates of accuracy i mean i, I don't know if you've tried this with just sort of free form but i mean it's great it's like the, yeah. the you know i wouldn't say like oh you know like you know you should take it away i mean it's actually just seems to be like a really good match right that the, the the technique fits the problem and particularly because right. you have to do it for these so that students can actually do it right so mm -hmm. it just seems to me you have this ideal situation right and that which is fantastic for the the sheer number of people that you're talking about right See, whenever I, whenever yeah. in education people say to me they'll say oh yeah you know we have big data and i'm like no tim's has big data <laughs> it's like <laughs> well, you understand so it's mm -hmm. i i think it's great thank you for your presentation it's really great oh, to see yeah. you well, and you have a great point because, you know, I showed some pictures of, oh, there's so many possible correct responses. You're right. If students had free drawing, the possibilities would be endless. And actually, in 2023, we have some of those free drawing items. So we'll actually be able to, you know, in a year or two from now, let you know, eh, how, here's how they do yeah. with those free drawing. You know, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I mean, and, and I'm sure that a year from now, and what we're the, the progress of these models, yeah. these it'll be a different, whole different, you know, situation there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I I think that's that's our other challenge, and I think one of the um, Jenny will be talking in two months, so we, we're we're already seeing that uh, not so much in the graphical responses, but certainly in in, in scoring text-based responses because of the recent revolution with all the GPT versions. So we just see that this is incredibly fast and we really have to adapt and adjust. Because mm -hmm. what, what you said two years ago is incredibly old already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. OK, any other questions? So we should thank our speaker again. Oh, oh this. Yeah. Yes, um, I I have a question. Funny enough, I was looking at this um at the report last night, um, and actually took a look at these um PSI items. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the one of the findings that I saw, um, spoke about um having a range of difficulty. How are we? How well? How is? How are you managing that for the PSI items to ensure that you're um, having items from a, a range of, of difficulties? And mm -hmm. and how do you incorporate um, like 
for different countries, different um, scenarios in, in terms of, I saw um, the one that I was looking at was talking about creating a watershed. And, and I was mm -hmm. thinking how many persons know what a watershed is. So um, how are we doing in terms of that? Okay, that goes certainly beyond this talk, but it's a very, very good question. Mm -hmm. um, there are expert groups, there is a lot of international feedback um, in terms of item development. So it's not just somebody sitting at Boston College and coming up with those items. Uh, we have international development partners. Uh, we have a whole group here, of course, at Boston College, but then there's really input from the 70 or so countries that participate. There are item writing workshops, several review phases um, that make sure that these items are uh, culturally appropriate. Uh, there's also a post hoc study once those items are selected and agreed upon by the countries. Um, where each country can actually say something about the curriculum coverage. There's a, uh, I, I'm blanking on the acronym now. There's a wonderful four letter acronym that essentially says, oh, for each country we can decide, was this item covered in the fourth grade or in the eighth grade or before? Um, so each country can actually tell us these items were not quite appropriate for us. We have we really don't teach that kind of stuff. And so we make something we could consider it. Uh, Dr. Brown is unfortunately not here. We could consider it probably a version of a sensitivity study where we essentially look at, OK, how much would the results change if we just drop those items? If country A or B says, well, these 10 percent of items were not really covered. What would happen? So we actually do these kinds of studies very carefully um, to, to check that. But uh, again, this is a very, very important topic. It's not quite our topic today, but I'm happy to share uh, resources there and, and the um, chapters and the methods and procedures, technical report and the main reporting that cover that kind of stuff. So if you send me an email, I will share, I, I will ask around what the latest versions are and we'll send some stuff um, that I can dig out and, and send them to you. Uh, okay, um, in, in terms of the ability, um, how, in terms of the ability levels of the, the PSI task, um, how do you, how do you gauge that in, um, in terms of what is asking students to do? There's field testing. There's also, of course, a lot of experience in item writing uh, around the world in those countries. There's curriculum matching. We have all the items are categorized in um, cognitive processes and, and content domains. They are categorized in expected difficulty. There's extensive field testing that we then use to select the items. Um, so all the items are very, very intensely tested and, and checked out. And if an item is too difficult or too easy, it won't be used. Uh, it's carefully monitored that the items can be answered by the vast majority of countries in a reasonable percentage or proportion, I should say. There's, of course, variation across countries in terms of proportion of items. For that, we actually have um, a design that is country level adaptive. So we mm -hmm. essentially use more easy blocks in somewhat lower performing countries. We use more challenging blocks of items in larger proportions in higher performing countries. So we try to adjust that we improve information. We can do this also with psychometric methods for in, in terms of expected information, but that goes way beyond what we can talk about here in this little uh, uh, session. But that will be covered probably in psychometrics too by Professor Lee, I guess, <laughs> on the information <laughs> function and stuff yes. like that. But the, there are a lot of tools that also psychometrics can offer, but then there are content experts and um, country experts and 
uh, review groups and field tests. So we try to be very careful there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. So we are out of time. Yep. So if there are more questions, please send them to us by email. Yes. Uh, this is recorded. This actually will be posted at some point, and we just heard that it will be posted in a more public link, not only internally. So we are very happy about that. Uh, and thank you again, Dillian. This was brilliant. And thank you, thank you so everybody, much. for showing up and asking questions. So every question was very much, very much appreciated. Thank you. Bye bye.